Good afternoon to all of you. It is good to see all of you in the house of the Lord. And uh, I do want to welcome our visitors who are coming in after, shall we say, uh, a short or a long break. It's good to see all of you. And this is uh, Pentecost Sunday. And as we begin, I do want to thank our young adults, Naomi and the team, uh, for doing such a wonderful job. They put the service together. They even organized the call to worship. And uh, that was amazing. And you heard me say this before, that Andrew does the announcements extremely well in a creative fashion. But I want to tell you, Andrew, today I must say you have stiff competition uh, coming up from none other than your sister. So you've got to work the line, Andrew. You've got to work the line. Keep at it, my friend. And I also want to thank Don Ali. You read, you read a difficult passage. It had all those jaw-breaking names of places. And I tell you, after the way you read it, you are ready for a course on Bible geography. <laughs> Keep it up. Uh, as I welcome you, I cannot uh, miss welcoming my good friend, Dr. Rajan Rajasingham. I'm seeing him after many moons. And as I saw him at the entrance, I said, now months the word. Uh, on all those stories of what happened in Sri Lanka. And I discovered that he has uh, uh, many relatives here. So from this day forth, if I am uh, on my best behavior, uh, you know why. Rajan Rajasingham is the cause. So last Sunday, we uh, celebrated Ascension Sunday. Thursday was the day when uh, we remember our Lord's Ascension. And on Sunday, we celebrated Ascension Sunday. And uh, somewhere around Tuesday or Wednesday last week, I uh, got a little slide. Somebody sent this to me, and I thought it was nice. And here's what it said. On Ascension Day, Jesus started to work from home. Do you like that? Yes, I thought that was good, theologically accurate as well. And on Ascension Day, our Lord Jesus Christ ascended back to the Father. And as we discovered last Sunday, He is not taking a break. He is at work. He is our mediator. He is our advocate. And He is our intercessor. And may we also say, He is our soon and coming King. Amen? Amen. That was the most, uh, uh, what can I say, unpentecostal response to an acknowledgement like that on Pentecostal Sunday, but we must move on. I want to begin by sharing with you uh, an email that went from the CEO to everybody in the organization. So mail from CEO to manager, from CEO to the man who oversees the teams or the woman who oversees the teams, and it was about the eclipse of the sun, the solar eclipse. And the CEO says to the manager, today at 11 o'clock, there will be a total eclipse of the sun. This is when the sun disappears behind the moon for two minutes. As this is something that cannot be seen every day, time will be allowed for employees to view the eclipse in the parking lot. Staff should meet in the lot at 10 to 11. When I will deliver a short speech, says the CEO, introducing the eclipse and giving some background information. Safety goggles will be made available at a small cost. Mail from manager to departmental heads. Today at 10 to 11, all staff should meet in the car park. This will be followed by a total eclipse of the sun, which will appear for two minutes. For a moderate cost, this will be made safe with goggles. The CEO will deliver a short speech beforehand to give us all some information. This is not something that can be seen every day. The mail from the departmental heads to the flow managers. The CEO will today deliver a short speech to make the sun disappear for two minutes uh, in the form of an eclipse. This is something that cannot be seen every day so staff will meet in the car park at 10 to 11. This will be safe if you pay a moderate cost. Mail from floor manager to supervisor. 10 or 11 staff are to go to the car park where the CEO will eclipse the sun for two minutes. This doesn't happen every day. It will be safe 
and as usual, it will cost you. Mail from supervisor to all staff. Some staff will go to the car park today and see the CEO disappear. It is a pity this does not happen every day. Now, we've all been there, haven't we? When um, the message that we want to deliver, the essence, the crux of the message has been de-emphasized and it moves somewhere else and instead some other emphasis is brought in. And we know the pain, the confusion that such situations have caused us. Excuse me. <clears throat> And I'm afraid, I'm afraid that that's exactly what happened or what has happened to the day or the celebration of Pentecost. Over the years, we read, of course, our young adults read the passage for us, but over the years, the emphasis has been moved to different nuances, different shades, and we have different groups emphasizing their experiences more than the purpose of real Pentecost. So during our time together, I want for us to ask a few questions. What is the real purpose of Pentecost? And we ask another question. What did our Lord Jesus Christ say about Pentecost? And to help answer these questions, I want to go to a passage that is found in Numbers chapter 11, and we won't bring the passage up right now. We have it. That's good. But in Numbers chapter 11, we have a very interesting narrative. And some of us might say on Pentecost Day, Numbers 11 is a very unlikely passage that you can pull some things out. But let me give you a little background to Numbers chapter 11. And then we read these verses that we have on the screen, which Naomi will bring up very shortly. In Numbers chapter 11, we see the people of Israel doing what they do very well. And what is that? They are complaining. You will see in Numbers chapter 11, they are complaining about the good times they had in Egypt. And this has now gotten to Moses. He cannot take it anymore. And he comes to God and he says, God, take my life. I've had enough with these people, just end my life. And God tells Moses in Numbers chapter 11, not so Moses, I want for you to find 70 people and I will pour out my spirit on them. And so Moses brings these 70 people and what we see in the passage is that God's spirit comes upon them. And then these people prophesy and there are two men, Eldad and Medad, who continue to prophesy. Now, there was a young person who came running to Joshua and said, Joshua, you know, Medad and Eldad, they are prophesying. And now when we get to this passage, we will see in verse 28, Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. Stop them from prophesying. The Spirit of God has come upon them and they are prophesying. Moses, my Lord, stop them. And here's Moses' reply. He said, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his Spirit on them. Then Moses and the elders of Israel returned to their camp. So look at Moses' response. He tells Joshua, are you jealous? Are you envious for me? He says, Joshua, don't be. Because we have had 70 people who received the Spirit of the Lord. And I wish that more would experience this. He's telling Joshua, rejoice. Because today what you have seen is not just me, but other people who received the Lord. And as a result of that, they are assisting me in my ministry. So if you read the whole narrative, you will recognize that God told Joshua, I am pouring my spirit on these 70 people for this one simple purpose. And that is to help you 
move on with the work. I am empowering them to assist you so that they can serve the broader picture of where I am leading my people. They were empowered for service. And so this is the story that I want to begin with. And then in the Old Testament, you come to the Psalms, you come to the judges, you come to the prophets. You will see the Spirit of the Lord coming upon His people and anointing them and empowering them for service. But once the project was over, the Holy Spirit would leave them because the, the atonement that was made possible by the work of our Lord Jesus Christ had still not taken place. When you come to the life of the prophets and the judges, you will see how the Spirit of the Lord came upon them and empowered them for service. And that is why the Spirit of God came upon them. And they faithfully served God. Of course, we have some very sad stories like Samson. We've been looking at the story of Samson. When the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he used it for some very selfish purposes. But other than sad stories like that, we see that the prophets of God, the men and women of God who, whom the Spirit came upon, they were empowered for service, God's work, so that they could encourage the people to do what God wanted them to do. And they were faithful to that task. Being empowered for service or receiving the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God coming upon them was not a badge of honor. It was not something that they wore with pride, but they used it with great humility. And then when we come to the New Testament, we see our Lord Jesus Christ make a very powerful declaration in Acts chapter 1. So if you trace the history from Numbers 11, and if you get into all the words of the prophets, you will see that the Spirit of God came upon them to empower them for service. So... The words of Moses, as we know, around 1500 to 1600 years before our Lord Jesus Christ, where the Spirit of the Lord came, empowered the people of God for service. And then you fast forward to Joel, the passage that uh, Peter refers to in his sermon. Around 800 years before Christ, Joel says towards the end, the day of the Lord, young men, old men, Ladies, gentlemen, old, young, everybody will receive the Spirit of the Lord and they will see visions, they will see dreams, and they will be involved in serving God. When you read Joel chapter 2, written almost 800 years before our Lord Jesus Christ's birth, you will recognize the purpose again is to effectively serve the people of God and to move in ministry. So what was the thought where Moses was concerned in Numbers chapter 11, where Moses said in that verse, he said, I wish that all of God's people would receive the Spirit. That was just a thought. That was only a prayer. But it now becomes prophecy in Joel chapter 2. And then again we fast forward to Acts chapter 1. And what is our Lord Jesus Christ saying in Acts chapter 1? In verse 6, 7, 8, all the way down to the next preceding, uh, preceding verses, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the world. Again, reinforcing that the purpose of the Spirit is to empower God's people for ministry. To empower them to do the works of God. And then we come to Acts chapter 2. We see that on the day of Pentecost, one of the three important festivals, they call these pilgrim festivals, the three festivals that all of God's people, all the Jews congregate, converge in Jerusalem to celebrate the day of Pentecost. It is worth noting that all the significant events all the significant happenings in the life of our Lord and the life of the church happened during some important feasts of the Lord as described in Leviticus 23. You come to our Lord's crucifixion and his death. You will see it happen during Passover and the unleavened bread. You come to his resurrection 
It happened during the Feast of First Fruits, and the Apostle Paul talks about that. And then you come to uh, the receiving or the coming down of the Holy Spirit. It happened during the Jewish Feast of Pentecost. They're all tied in together. And so on this day of Pentecost, when all the Jews from the then known world came together, God sends his spirit down. And somebody once said this, at Bethlehem, we had God with us. At Calvary, we had God for us, where Jesus Christ went to the cross for us. But at Pentecost, we have God in us, where the Spirit of God came and took residence in us because now the price for sin had been paid by our Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to share three reminders on this day of Pentecost, three reminders that we need to hold in our hearts as we continue to serve the Lord. The first is that we need to remind ourselves that the message of God is for all of God's people. And you will see in Acts chapter 2, we had Jews, we had proselytes, we had all the people who feared and believed God from the then known world. They had converged on Jerusalem. And God granted this wonderful experience of Pentecost. But it doesn't end there. If you read the book of Acts, you will see when you go down to Acts chapter 8, the people of Samaria received the same experience as in Acts chapter 2. You go to Acts chapter 10, you will see a Gentile by the name of Cornelius who experienced the same Pentecost that we saw in Acts chapter 2. You go to Acts chapter 19, we see the disciples of John who were followers of John the Baptist. They have the same experience as Acts chapter 2. What was God showing? He was showing that the Spirit of God was given to all people. It was not given to just one group of people. And when the Spirit of God came upon them, they were empowered for service. We see that in the words of our Lord Jesus Christ in Acts 1 chapter 8. When the Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. And what's the purpose of that power? To be my witnesses. And you will see that right through. So God was saying, I am no respecter of persons. Every people group will receive and has received the same experience. But sadly, today Pentecost has divided us. The experience of Pentecost has divided us. When we see in the book of Acts that it united, God was saying, this is one experience where my spirit comes and resides within you. This is one experience where my spirit empowers you for ministry. This ought to unite all of you together as my people. But sadly, it has divided us right down to the dogs. And you might wonder, what's that? Let me tell you a story about the dogs. There was a Baptist pastor. There was a Baptist pastor uh, who owned a dog for many, many years. And then the dog passed away. And so he and his wife decided to get another dog. So they went to one of these places that have uh, dogs that have been abandoned, left, and so on and so forth. And they looked around and they talked to the person in charge. And the person said, uh, well, we have all these dogs on display and tell us what do you do. And he said, I'm a pastor. He said, we have just the dog for you. There's another pastor who passed away and his dog is here. So let's take a look. And this is a pastor's dog. And he does special things. And so the wife and the Baptist minister went. And then the owner of the, uh, the dog center, he knelt down, made eye contact with the dog. And he said, uh, he gave the dog a Bible and he said, Psalm 23. And the dog turned with his paws, turned to Psalm 23. And he said, see, the dog is definitely able to do good Christian things. Pastor's dog. And so then the uh, pastor, the Baptist pastor, asked this gentleman, uh, does the dog do any regular dog tricks? You know, like the normal things that normal dogs do. And he said, let's try. And so the man, the man who was in charge of the center made eye contact with the dog and he said, heal. And the dog immediately placed its paw on the man's head and started howling. And the Baptist pastor said, oh, this is a Pentecostal dog. We don't want to have anything to do with it. 
And so that's what I meant when I said that it's divided right down to the dogs. But that was not really God's purpose. If you look at how God started working with his people, where God started working with his people through his Holy Spirit, it was all about empowering them for service. So the first reminder is that the message of Pentecost is for all people. And God has united all of his people, empowered them for works of service, because that's what he wants us to do, work together. Pentecost is also a reminder that we have been sealed by God. And if we can bring up Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, Naomi. Yes, thank you very much. And the Apostle Paul here says, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So the day of Pentecost or Pentecost Sunday is a reminder that each one of us as children of God have been sealed by God's Spirit. Now we all understand what seals do and what seals symbolize. Seals symbolize ownership. And we see in the Word of God in Ephesians and several other passages that we are God's prized possession. We are God's own people. And He has sealed us with His Spirit. And somewhere within us there is a message that says, set apart as God's prized possession. And so no matter what we go through, even in times of turmoil and stress and the storms, it is encouraging to know that I belong to God and I am God's prized possession. Some of us remember Sandy Patty and uh, there was a song that she did many years ago and one line goes like this, in his hands there is only safety. Some of us are nodding, you know the song, in his hands there is only safety. Nothing else can touch you except him. And if you think about it, what we are saying is that when we are sealed by God's Spirit, we are held in His hands. And when He holds us in His hands, nothing else can touch us except Him. And He means good, and in His hands there is safety. The third reminder that I want to leave with us today is that we have been empowered for fruit-bearing and endowed with gifts. So we have been empowered and we have received this endowment where we have been granted gifts. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 10, Naomi. Thank you. And it says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. That verse reminds us of a few things. First, it is a reminder that each one of us has received at least one spiritual gift. So Pentecost is a reminder, yes, God's Spirit came upon us, but God's Spirit came upon us for one express purpose. And that was to empower us, to empower you and me as God's people to be His witnesses. And to that end, He has also granted us gifts. And in 1 Peter 4.10 it says, you all have at least one gift. Use that for the building up of God's kingdom. And here he says, the Apostle Peter says, use it to serve others and be faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. As I close, I want to unashamedly put a plug in for the purpose groups. <laughs> Because what does 1 Peter chapter 4.10 say? That each one of us has received at least one spiritual gift. And I ask a question. We have been announcing about the purpose groups. We have been encouraging you to get involved. Ask yourself, what are my gifts? What are my strengths? What has God blessed me with? And see which purpose group best aligns with the gifting and with the talents and the skills that God has placed upon you. And get involved in that purpose group and use the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. Use the, the residence, use the fact that God the Holy Spirit has sealed you. He dwells within you and use that to glorify God 
through these different ministries. So on this day of Pentecost, these are the three reminders. One, the day of Pentecost, the message of Pentecost was to, uh, was to remind us that it is for all of God's people. Um, all across genders, across ethnicities, across nationalities, we have all been brought together by the work of the Spirit. Secondly, it is a reminder that we have been sealed. And as a result, what that means is that we belong to God. And thirdly, it is a reminder that we have been empowered. We have received gifts for service. And may God enable us to use those gifts so that together we can empower others for service and we can use it to serve God. May God bless the reflection of his word this afternoon.